transferred to the cloud. All right, welcome everyone to the third fireside chat hosted by the Turing Way. I am Malvika Sharan, a co-lead of the Turing Way along with Dr. Kirsty Whitaker, um, who is also on the call. The Turing Way is an open source, open collaboration and community developed resource on making data science accessible and comprehensible for wider community. We represent an international community of researchers who create resources as chapters and community practices, bringing perspectives from their countries and backgrounds. This fireside chat series is an effort towards creating a space where people can gather and exchange concerns, explore challenges, and share different practices that work in different contexts. Please note uh, that we have a shared etherpad to facilitate written note taking and invite ideas from you who have joined to listen in. It's a really big panel, so unfortunately, we will not have interactive session. Instead, we will use the entire 90 minutes in having as much discussion about translation, linguistic diversity, and multilingual practices in different communities and uh, spaces. But we really do love to hear from you. So please use the etherpad uh, to share your ideas, um, share any resource that you have in mind. We have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. For any concern reporting of an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call or further ideas to improve accessibility, please email the Turingway at gmail.com. Or you can also directly reach out to Kirsty or me by uh, emailing us directly. Uh, we will add the information on, on Etherpad as well. With that, I'm really delighted to welcome my dear friend, colleague, and an inspiring community builder herself, Anilda van der Walt, to kick off today's session by introducing the topic and our speakers. Thank you very much, Malvika, um, for this very warm welcome. Um, it's a great privilege to be here with you and to co-host this session. Um, I'd always also like to welcome all our participants and panelists um, and hope that you're going to enjoy the session with us. As Malvika said, my name is Analda van der Walt. I run Telarify, which is a small consultancy in South Africa, where we are passionate about the development of data science skills and inclusive communities of practice on the African continent and beyond. My own interest in the topic of multilingualism in data science stems from human capacity development work I've been involved in since 2004. Most of our training materials are always as typically, typically can it be expected, available in English. And our workshops um, are also always conducted in English only, with examples and data sets from the global north. Well, uh, whilst these resources that we use are often published as open resources, and we're incredibly grateful for community contributors, um, it does pose a problem. While we were running a variety of bioinformatics sure. events, um, and later general introductions to coding in R and Python, I started noticing that it was incredibly useful to have a lead or a co-instructor who spoke a language with, that was the home language of our learners. So in Ethiopia, for example, it was Amharic. In South Africa, it could be any of the 10 national languages, not English. In Mauritius, it was Creole. And in Senegal and Cameroon, French was very useful, even though it's not the native tongue of the country's people. It was not just about being able to speak the local language, but it was also about translating examples into something relatable for our participants. I was privileged in, 2020, uh, in 2021 to, as part of a, uh, the AFRI Map R project, which I can put a link to in the etherpad, where we ran a four hour tutorial based on an African data set to teach mapping in R. Through feedback from our community, we had realized earlier that there was a great need for French speaking instructors due to large interest from Francophone Africa, African countries. We partnered with our French speaking instructors and were able to translate our full tutorial. And then we ran the workshop that was split up into two rooms where one room was fully offered in French with instructors and helpers also fluent in English and French, um, and even a variety of other African languages. And, um, the other room was offered in English with the French materials also there um, available and, and the instructors also able to speak a variety of languages. We're hoping to run a similar setup again this year since it, the feedback was really positive. But the question remains, how can we make these efforts, efforts like this sustainable? 
Today, we're going to hear from a fantastic panel of speakers about their experiences with translational efforts that go beyond language and workflows um, and technology. We'd like to encourage you, our audience, to ask questions and help us facilitate a stimulating, honest conversation about the role of multilingualism in making data science more inclusive and accessible. Uh, I just want to uh, note that unfortunately, Prof. Langa Kamala is unable to join us today. Um, therefore, we won't be covering policy issues in the panel, but we would still like to invite audience members who have expertise in this area to share ideas and challenges in our collaborative document. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our panel to introduce themselves and shortly share an, open, uh, an opening remark about their interest in the topic. Um, it, and just for reference, if you want to learn more about our participants and our, pan our panelists, their full bios is listed off the event bright page, uh, which the link is also in the etherpad, which we've shared. Um, and I would like to start off with our first panelist, Dr. Camilla Randall Smith from the Alan Turing Institute in the UK. Thank you, Camilla. Hi, thank you, Amanda. Uh, so yeah, thank you for, for inviting me, having me here. So um, Camilla, um, a research data scientist at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, I am from Venezuela originally, although I've been, I think most of my professional life, I have done it outside of Venezuela, so I have always worked in English. But my 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 native language is Spanish, and even if I've been I've been away from Venezuela for twelve years now, but I during that whole time I've been trying to still connect with uh, colleagues back home and and in other Latin American countries, and we have created a a, a number of kind of initiatives of like teachings, uh, for example, particle physics which was my 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 background uh, in, 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 in certain universities might not have like the expertise on that. And, and so we, we, we for many years have been having these different initiatives and two years ago or three years ago we we started a new project called uh, La Conga Physics, which is uh, it's a network of universities in Latin America connected with uh, universities in, in Europe and it's an Erasmus uh, uh, sponsored project and we had to devise a one year uh, degree for advanced physics students and we wanted to give it a very important like data science uh, context uh, into it. And I wanted to bring all the things I learned at the Turing into that uh, into that program. And I thought that the Turing way was like a perfect uh, amount of resources that we could give uh, uh, students to, to start their career with the right foot and doing things right and, and well. So, but also at that time, we, I remember like, and it's kind of like the, the, the view of La Conga that uh, we should provide uh, knowledge in people's languages. And so just giving them the Turing way like that and say, well, use Google Translate or something, uh, it wasn't gonna be worth it, and also because we we did try, and and as there is so much technical material, like Google Translate doesn't translate that well at all. So me and a couple of my colleagues, we kind of said, okay, let's try to start the translation process, and, and then at the same time, like there was this discussion already in a couple of book dash of the Turing way of how to do translation, and and we started like a, a, an initial um, effort to translate it from the most inexperienced people. Like, I had never translated anything in my life and none of my, my, my colleagues did. And we were kind of doing this uh, uh, um, and, and, and learning this together. So I'll, I'll, I might uh, talk more about that later, but that's my, that, that's my background. That's the reason I'm here. So I next then. Uh, hi everyone, I'm David Perez Suarez. I'm a research software developer at University College London in UK. And even though now we're helping researchers to write software at my work, my background is in astrophysics and was through that that I got into translations. Years ago, we were uh, having a citizen science project through the SU Universe uh, platform about solar features that appear like sunspots and stuff. And that was an opportunity for me to look into, I want that to be seen by my family, by my parents, and then they know what I'm doing because over all my PhD, they didn't even know what I was studying outside a sunny place like the Canaries when I was in Northern Ireland studying the sun. So the, that project that I started as an English project, we were looking into how to build it, 
the platform was built already. So we were trying to put how help getting the translation from people. So I got some people involved, we translated it and it was there in, in a language um, platform that it could allow other people to understand what they were classifying in this citizen science project. Not even a year later, uh, through the carpentries, the carpentries um, workshop, all the material that they're, they're provided to train young researchers into tools that tools that they need to use for or to make their research more useful. It was all on English, and a group of people started to say, "Hey, why we don't translate that into Spanish?" So we were starting to work that into the translation. And for me, was the move that I got into that was not directly on the translation itself, but on how to manage the translation, how to be able to, to keep track of what has been changing on something so that we could keep up to date the translations to that uh, particular source of the material. And we will talk more about that later on what problems or things are in there. But from that, I've been just looking on how other communities from mostly from the open source communities, how they do translations. Direct, maybe your browser that depending on where you are, you have different um, uh, languages or settings to anything uh, in the computer. So that has been my entry to the translation world, which is fascinating. So that's me. Excellent. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'd like to hand over to Batul. Uh, thank you, Anilda. Uh, I'm going to be very, very brief. Hi, everyone. Um, I feel really, really humbled to be here with this wonderful panel. I'm Batul Marzouk, a computational biologist affiliated with KMARC, which is a research institution here in Saudi Arabia and the University of Liverpool as well in the UK. Uh, outside my day job, I've been re relatively active in a number of open science communities, including the Turing Way. And I'm very, very interested in the adoption of open science outside the global north. Uh, having born and raised in the Middle East, uh, I do believe that open science has potential role in improving both scientific and economic output in the Middle region. So we established an open science community here in Saudi Arabia where we try to introduce open science practices to scientists, students. Um, unlike the other panelists, uh, I don't have much experience with the translation. I'm a bit the odd one here. Uh, my experience mainly stems from introducing Wakeflow using localization platform, which can help translate open science materials to Arabic. Uh, and I'm currently trying with the help of Camilla to introduce an easy way of translating the Turing way. Uh, I do believe that language barrier uh, not just have a serious consequences in the uptake of scientific knowledge by public, but also by decision makers, and something that I've seen. Uh, and that's pretty much me. Thank you very much, Patul. We're really thrilled to have you here. And I'd like to hand the mic to Bobby. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm so very glad to be here, uh, part of the event. Well, my name is Bobby Shabangu, and I am talking to you currently from Johannesburg in, uh, in South Africa. I am the current uh, sitting uh, president of the Wikimedia, uh, uh, Wikimedia chapter, and uh, what we basically do is to encourage uh, translation basically from the English Wikipedia to the South African other official uh, languages, especially the indigenous languages. And uh, basically I joined Wikipedia in 2013. Uh, it was by accident. I was a radio producer and my, the, 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 the role that I was playing really was to create content for the show. And as a producer, always you go online to search for content only to find out that most of the content that is there is written in English. And one of the things that I had to do really was to translate that content from English to my mother tongue, uh, which is Siswati. And uh, I find that there's really death really in, uh, in, in indigenous languages from uh, English to the South African uh, indigenous languages. And basically, that's when I started editing Wikipedia and started thinking about using digital platforms to carry knowledge from um, uh, English to our, our African languages. But only to find out that the problem is even way bigger than that, because uh, I eventually find out that the, 
is more content about Europe and, uh, and America, but very much less or scant content about um, African uh, uh, knowledge and knowledge system on the internet. And uh, there's even less, you know, female that are contributing in there. Most people that are contributing there are male, white, you know, with a degree in IT, most of them. And uh, basically, that's uh, what I wanted to do to change the world. So in a small way, I'm contributing into raising awareness uh, in South Africa to especially people that are coming from previously disadvantaged communities that are not aware that they should not only consume knowledge that is in the internet, but they should also contribute towards that knowledge. Yeah, basically, that is me, and I'm so glad to be part of this uh, event and looking forward to the, uh, the upcoming discussions. Thanks over to you. Thank you very much, Bobby. We're really glad to, be, to have your voice here as well today and looking forward to the in insights that you'll share with us. And our final panelist that I'd like to introduce is Janina. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Shanina Veshini Saivene. Uh, I am a Latin American cis woman. My native language is Spanish, and I learned English as a consequence of wanting to learn to code, to make computer programs. Uh, I come from a lower middle class family, and we couldn't afford to cost of learning of the languages. But libraries and free school were my tool to learn. Uh, I have a degree in computer science and a master degree in data mining. I am a scientist and I'm also a teacher. And I am not a professional translator. <laughs> However, uh, I'm part of several community of practice where we have done collaborative and voluntary translation from English to Spanish. For example, guide on how to participate in the communities, lesson on programming tools and books, such as Teaching Tech Together and Art for Data Science. We also have created our packages where the documentation and the data are in Spanish. And we have encouraged other community to set packages and paper in a language for review. I have also been part of the organization of trilingual conferences such, such as Latin art, we speak Portuguese, Spanish, and English, and conferences where we accept that in any language such as User 2021. I also co-founded Meta Docencia, which means Meta Teaching in English, where we create teaching material in Spanish and we are translating them into Portuguese. Due to my personal and community path, I consider that having the material in native language is a fundamental and necessary but not sufficient condition to give access to knowledge and to allow the creation of new knowledge. Translation are one of the tools to achieve this. Another tool is to have this kind of conversation. Many thanks to the Turing Way for inviting me to be part of this. Anel Dyer uh, on mute. That has to Thanks. happen. That has to happen. No, it has to happen. Uh, I double clicked actually. Um, Yanni, it's great to have you here and we're really looking forward to you from your experiences as well. So Malvika, are you going to open the floor for with questions yeah i want to start in like a very you know personal note so i'm from india it's a country with over 1800 languages but not a single national language instead indian parliament has chosen hindi and english uh, as their official language uh, as well as 22 languages that are used at the administrative purpose so Many languages are also just spoken and they are sung in folk songs and written in poems, but they do not exist at, as scriptures. Um, and to me, that was supernatural. Like that's really natural way for me to understand language. And this language linguistic diversity was something that made me expect that all the countries would have street science in five languages at the same time. Um, I also read Hindi version of Tintin comic books and watched movies dubbed from their original language into regional language. And I imagine, you know, a lot of contexts were changed to make them funny for Indians and not <laughs> Hollywood watchers. Um, and of course, many of you can relate with that, even from other countries uh, or other contexts. And I lived in Germany for 10 years. German is a hard language. Um, and no translation of same street sign does not exist in multiple languages in all the countries. So anyway, I wanted to actually start asking a conversation by reading a couple of 
sentences from South Africa's language policy framework, uh, which one of our speakers who couldn't join us today, Professor Langa Kumalo, would have actually represented better. But I think it's really beautiful, and I thought that I would probably just uh, use that here. It says that a person's language is in many ways a second skin, a natural possession of every normal human being with which we use to express our hopes and ideals, articulate our thoughts and values, explore our experience and customs and construct our society and the laws that govern it. It is through language that we function as human beings in an ever-changing world. With such central role of language in our life beyond scientific research, I would like to ask a few of our speakers to share some examples from humanities, arts, literature, or other domains where translation or multilingual practices are more mature. So you can choose to give a positive or not so positive example. So I would actually kick it off by asking David, please do share something with us. Well, mine is for an anecdotic example as a, when I was living in South Africa, even though we have few people uh, from there in the panel. And um, one of the things that I impacted me the most was when I was working in the mornings and before going to work, I was putting the TV and I was watching Sesame Street in a language. I didn't know which language was that because it was not English and I didn't recognize it. the differences between all the other ones. And I was trying to guess what they were teaching on those Sesame Street chapter, um, episodes. But then the day after I watched and it was the same episode, but in a different language. And I have to wait till Friday to know what it was that in English. And it was interesting how all, all the mental things I was creating in my head of, oh, that might be this thing. And then when I was getting English, I was like, oh, right, that was not what I thought it was. Uh, but with all the colleagues I have there, uh, it was a fun experience of telling them, is that this thing? It made me thought of the thing. Uh, now, South Africa have a, how many official language? 11, 17, I don't know, many. <laughs> and they were only five days of the week and they were, one of them was in English, another was probably was uh, another day before was in Afrikaans. So there were only three other days for all the minority languages there. But uh, for me, that was a very good way of spreading the knowledge and letting kids to learn other things the day after or the day before, depending on in which way you were your local language. Yeah, that's that's really beautiful. And I also want to actually ask people listening in to share in the chat if they have a funny or good or pleasant, whatever joyful example from their own uh, region that was accessible through language or you know, vice versa. Um, I would ask uh, another one of the panelists who have some example to share. I should have asked for the names before, but anyway, I wonder, yeah, Camilla, please. It's just, just another, so, so Latin America is massive and there's people who speak very, very different languages. And we watch TV, which is usually in English, right? And so it has to be translated into Spanish so people can, well, I think now they're translated less, but when I was growing up, it was translated. And uh, which Spanish do you translate it to? That's kind of like, and so obviously Mexico is a very big country and with a lot of like cultural uh, strength as well. And so it was, it was translated usually like a neutral Spanish, we, for, for me always sounded Mexican. Uh, and something I always find funny is like, I, I went to Chile to visit my, my family like a couple of uh, years ago and my cousin who is five, does, he, he lives in Chile, but he has kind of a Mexican accent because he, watches TV uh, of people speaking using words that no one will ever use. And, and my aunt was saying, yeah, yeah, this is so common at that age. Then after they kind of start growing up and interacting with more people and going to school and stuff, they start getting their, their, their local accent. But I, I feel like it can have a big influence in the way you translate uh, in, 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 in words that children use, so yeah. Bobby. Sure. You know, as uh, my colleagues are talking, it reminds me of a recent event that happened uh, here in South Africa, where a, a king of the Zulu nation uh, passed on. And according to our custom, uh, you know, as, uh, as, as, as uh, black people, let me just put it like that, uh, kings don't die, you know, they bow or, or um, we, we say they go under the tree. And uh, the Zulu news and, and, and what was going on on, on on social media when it was announced that the king has passed on, 
uh, some of the news, especially the, the, the traditional white media, they did not get what was actually being said there because people were talking about um, the king going under a tree to bow there. And um, in fact, they don't, the, the, the king's name even changed to a rhino. You know, they say the rhino has gone under the tree to bow there. And all of a sudden, everyone who is speaking that language understood what it meant. But uh, most of, um, you know, the other, other nations, they did not really understand what was, was, was going on. And uh, it was even funny when the king was supposed to be now buried, you know, because uh, we, we don't bury the king. In fact, uh, we, 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 we send the king uh, to the river to wash so that he can wait for the ancestors. Um, you know, people understood this, you know, most of the people that speak the language understood this, but uh, many of the, you know, uh, traditional white and uh, people who don't speak the language did not understand it. So it was so very interesting that uh, they, they, they needed now uh, to be scholars in the university's academic institution who come and explain the tradition first and explain the context, you know, and they explain that uh, once a king dies, it means the nation has died and kings don't die, you know, <laughs> and take them back and take them step by step and the burial, we don't even call it a burial, you know. So, so it was so much interesting in that way. And uh, it, it also made me think that whenever now you have to translate some of the rituals that are happening in writing, you lose a lot of context because some of the songs and some of the rituals uh, the way they are being, you know, done in the funeral, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very much different. And it cannot, words that are written down cannot capture uh, the songs and how they are being done in dancing and in the way, you know, it's the structure of, of, of the burial is going on. So, yeah, that's, that was very, very much uh, interesting uh, to, uh, to, to, to note. Over to you. That reminds me so much of uh, the stories that my grandma would tell. And I think if we translate that into English, they make zero sense. And even like phrases and idioms from English, if translated to any other language, they kind of lose the context. So I think there's this literal translation versus understanding the context. And I think we're going to discuss that in the panel, but I'm going to pass it back to Anelda. Well, Vika, you quick for me. I'm still looking at what people are saying in the comments in the chat, but uh, thank you so much for everyone who is commenting in the chat. Um, so we have a, a first question that we would like to pose to David. Um, David, the question is, what are different aspects of translation um, that you encountered in the projects that you've done? And what are some of the challenges you have faced and how have you addressed them? Good, so I have a... I'm gonna break that into three different areas. So I'm gonna leave the translation ones to the last bit because the first one that I faced was uh, the technological, the, the technology to help me. My, my, my goal was not the translation in itself, but how to be, how to know that my translation is gonna get out of date. And with that, I spent a lot of uh, headaches <laughs> trying to figure out how to make that work. And, and at the end, I think I managed, I found a way, at least for the cartridge material, but uh, that brings me to another point, which is not all the translation had to be based on a source truth, let's say. So you have a source material that you want to translate, let's say a book or a lesson on something, uh, a movie, or a something, and then translate that. And that is considered as a source truth. But there's other type of translations and and one of them is Wikipedia, right? So Wikipedia, you get pages might translate one into the other, but then they have completely different life. And it's up to the people who want maybe to translate more stuff. And sometimes the translation becomes even better than the original one because it has a completely different life. Now, with that in mind, the, my second point was about uh, the organization. How do you organize the people that are gonna work with you? If you're the only translator, easy because you're not going to change your styles halfway through. But if you have many translators, then you have to look into how to get a consistency around which words you use, around which language you use, around which uh, style you write the translation, because it's never one-to-one -one between one language to another. 
And then, as I say, finally is the, is the translation itself, which is a one that not only translation is something, I say translation, you translate A from B, and that's it's translated from English into Spanish, and that's it. Because as we've heard from, from Camila and probably from Jenny, is that we have many different types of Spanish. Even I'm from Spain, and sometimes my words that doesn't translate well with the people in the other side of Spain. So that is what is called localization, which is make it those translations, not only the language as the words, but also the examples that's shown there, so that it makes it more uh, direct to the person who is reading that book, watching that uh, movie, or uh, going through some material to learn Python, and then say, oh, OK, that example of cricket doesn't make any sense to me, because I don't know what cricket is. But if you put me that into a, a game that we play in the Canaries, then I will understand what is the rules and it will be less uh, mental overhead for me to understand the teaching that is uh, behind that. Now, what other people think about this? Yeah, thank you very much. I want, I would like to um, just look at one point that you were talking about uh, right at the beginning. You were saying sometimes um, the, the origin the translation, the translation may become better than the original document or the original source. Um, and that's quite an interesting point because that brings us to one of the points that we discussed in the preparation for the session as well um, about translating not only from English to other languages, but also making sure that especially the Global South information and knowledge is being made available to, um, to the Global North and, and other regions um, and the challenges around that. Um, so that's, that's a very interesting point. Um, does any of the other panelists have a comment on, on what David had said, or would you, would you like to add any um, challenges or solutions that you found for your translational projects? Yanni? I can continue if you want. Um, um, perhaps uh, what I will share here has a lot to do with just David say, um, I'm going to share some uh, examples about what he talks, uh, especially on these to uh, do more local, more regional, the, the content of the, of the translation. So uh, just had he say you, um, and we are saying, <laughs> all the panelists say, and you, have, you, you just don't take the words in one language and to put in the other language and that's it. Um, especially in collaborative translation process, uh, we have to make this decision and reach agreements, as David say. So which voice will we use? Is going to be academic or, conversion, or conversational? Uh, we have to specify what dialect or regional variation of the language is going to be used in Spanish. Is going to be Latin American or is going to be uh, uh, from Spain, for example. And even in Latin America, we, when we translate one of the book, we have the translation from one country and the reviewer from, from different countries because we speak different. Very beautiful, but different. So for uh, have the, the best text that more people can understand and take advantage, we need that kind of, of revision which technical term we are going to translate and which we will not translate. And that has to do, for example, when people looking for more materials and help in, in the internet. So if we translate all the technical terms, perhaps they are not going to find anything else. So how do you make that decision? Uh, in Spanish, for, for example, we have to say how we will handle gender. We should use non-sexy language, inclusive language. In the books I participate, we decide to be gender neutral. We have to adjust wording to avoid having to assign a gender, but we can uh, all the time. So what, what, what we do when that happens? What we choose to use feminine and masculine or masculine feminine split and for consistency through the text and to show that there is no particular hierarchy between the gender, we alternate the use of feminine or masculine between chapters with the use being consistent through each chapter. 
So for example, for example, by bibliographic reference, uh, we, if we use a book or we reference a paper in English, we left the title in English, we translate to Spanish. And if we found some version in Spanish, we are going to link to that one. For example, a carpentry learning, uh, if the original is in English, we have that in Spanish, we are going to point to the Spanish one. Um, we even um, translate figures, diagrams, we add video subtitles, and at some point, we even re-record the videos in Spanish, and we add subtitles in English. So every single one of shows uh, of this decision we make, we are also giving a message to our readers. Yeah, when we decide uh, the gender question, we, we not only communicate the content of the books, but we are also communicate some values when we do these translations and take these decisions. And uh, we also translate samples. Uh, they say a sport, songs, books, cities, uh, name of mountains, rivers, uh, books. We also regionalize all these examples. Uh, the analogies, analogies can be really tricky uh, for translate to, to one language to, to, to another. And humor, humor is tricky and dangerous. <laughs> so all these things, all these decisions are going to actually generate a new text. Um, uh, but I think that we should have this discussion and, and, and have this, make this decision when we generate this or translate this new knowledge to one part of the world to the other. Sorry, this so long. Thank you very much. I think um, it's very, very valuable contribution that you're giving there. Um, and I've also, for people who are interested, pasted a link to Teaching Tech Together, which is one of the projects that Yanni was involved in, in terms of translation. And there's some guidance there about how they were dealing with, with translations for the book. Um, I noticed that Kirsty was saying, I wonder if Bobby's example link up with machine translation. Um, and that's a big question about all the things that Yanni and David has just been saying and some of the other panelists are, what are the pitfalls then of, of machine translation? Um, and uh, um, what should we look out for? How can we use technology to really translate meaning, feelings, and, and all the things that is maybe not um, yet be, being done so well? Malvika, do we, are we moving on to the next question? Yeah, let's hear Bobby um, before we move on to that. Bobby, please do share your thoughts. Sure. Uh, perhaps my my example will be linked to what Yanni has already uh, spoken about. But um, on my experience, uh, just quickly, I in my language, my mother tongue, and many of the languages that I speak uh, speak about five of them, five six, you know, of, of our South African languages. Uh, you find that there are no words they totally don't exist words uh, you know that are, are in english you know when you want to translate into our uh, our, our our languages our uh, you know indigenous languages when you have to explain to your grandmother a certain concept you know about something you find out that is not even there and they really <laughs> remind me of one day when we were doing an edit workshop we were teaching people it was it was young people uh, we were teaching them how to, to you know to translate a, a certain uh, uh, concept that we have in in our in our in our culture it's called lobola you can call it a lot of people some people call it dowry you know where a, a bride you know the, the bridegroom they have to pay cows you know to to the to the family of the of the bride and uh, uh, the names of those cows we have them in our languages but in english we don't have those names of those cows we don't even in numbers, for an example, we don't have a million in my language. In Zulu, you don't have a million. We just say the counters are tired. Once you have, you say that, we know that it's coming from, and in fact, I was told by my grandmother this, that a kings in the past, they used to have a lot of cows and the counters, they used to count, count, count. And then once they reach hundred, once they reach thousands, once they, they reach a million, they cannot count. They say they are tired now because the cows are many. So in, in, a, in a million, you're saying the counters are tired. But if you have to now translate that into English, it, 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 it says something else. Yeah, but it, it's just a, 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 an example. It reminded me when Yanni was talking about some of these things that we, I encountered in the past. Thanks over to you. 
Thank you, Bobby. And I just realized that what you're saying now is also probably echoing a lot with Batul's experiences. Uh, when she started working on establishing the open science community in Saudi Arabia, and they wanted to translate some of um, the resources that was available through a project that Malvika ran, the Open Life Science Project, and finding that there wasn't exactly the words to translate some open science concepts in um, in Arabic. Batul, would you like to say a little bit about how you went about that challenge? Oh, thank you so much, Janelda. Yeah. Uh, so I, I found it very, very helpful when you use a glossary or shared translation memory from other projects that use similar terms. And this is what David was saying about localization platforms. So many of these localization platforms, they have their own glossary in different languages, and you can also share the memory translation across different uh, separated project. Uh, I do admire what the localization lab has done. So they published all the glossary they made for, I think, 37 languages in the web. So you can really take these and use them within your own project. Um, I, I'm very new within localization. So I've done is I went through, I think I've tested six or seven localization platform and some of them do over like one-to-one -one conversation. And I've seen like, what kind of this support they have for open source, how they are with RTL, like uh, right to left languages, because this is uh, like a headache when you do any kind of translation and you add a different language inside it. Uh, and I found like some of this is very, very useful. Um, I took, uh, I've read all what David has published and documentation he's done in the, in the commentaries that was very, very helpful. And we also went to through what Yanni did in uh, teaching tech together, like uh, what she said about contextualization and deciding how you're gonna like decide what tone you would, you want to make in the translation itself. Yeah, that, that's pretty much my experience. Yeah in that respect. Uh, I would just like to echo as well what Camilla had said actually about um, outside the digital infrastructure and outside technology, what she mentioned about how researchers really should not assume that their science can be communicate, communicated with a single language. Um, this is definitely exemplified uh, at the start of the, the pandemic, like uh, in my own community, there was a lot, a lot of misconception about the nature of COVID. Uh, none of the literature back then was published in the local language, which is Arabic. And the only way people did receive that knowledge is through interpretation of other individuals who either have biased uh, uh, knowledge or sometimes limited understanding of the subject because the public can't really reach or read the actual source and make their own interpretation. Uh, it's true that literature is full of jargon, technical things, but translation, I think, can be one, uh, can be one of the main causes that can really contribute it largely to the problem back then. Uh, and even outside uh, COVID-19, it, uh, it does help. I mean, I do encounter that a lot with, the, especially my family, people around me. Uh, you can't cite or bring on um, a source or paper that is totally in different language that's totally unrelated to them, but they will rely on other individuals or on social media and these kind of resources. So translation in that context is very, very important. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Thank you, Batul. And thank you for picking up on, on things that Camilla had said earlier as well. Um, this leads us nicely into the next question, which we're going to put to Yanni um, to open the floor with. Uh, we would like to know a little bit, and we've started to touch on the difference between um, translation and contextualization or um, localization. Yanni, can you, can you share a little bit more about your experience with translation of, as you were saying specifically, humor, um, analogies and other things that, that is so essential for making text, making resources relatable um, and really useful in a teaching context or in a, in a research context for local people. Yeah, well, to, to add just a little about what I already shared, um, for example, we, for one of the translation, we changed the name of the people. So there are names that we are used to. Yeah, you have Michael, Jonathan, Brian, uh, 
we have some of those names here, but it's going to be more close if we talk about Juan, um, Natalia, um, that, this, this kind of, of names. For, for example, we also choose books from our region. There were uh, some exercises and uh, name books. And one of the books was, uh, the name was Harry Potter. And we, not only because it's in English, uh, because the book, the author of the books is a kind of uh, person who is again trans people. And uh, we want to remove that uh, quote uh, on the, from the book because of that reason. And we choose um, a book from a Brazilian author, for, for example. And then was an example about capital cities. Um, when you uh, confuse a city which is big uh, and you think that is the capital of the country when actually it's not. And the example was from Canada that I don't have idea. <laughs> so we changed again from Brasilia and from, from Brazil that we know about that example. So, or, or the songs, we use a lot of songs from Maria Elena Walsh, which is, um, author pretty important from Argentina and I used uh, a song from kids. Uh, well, she was an amazing writer, but uh, we know her because of their song. So we, we use that kind of examples. Um, and the other things we do that Natalia mentioned in the chat uh, for each figure and dagger man, we also write the alt text explaining what that is shown. So. Uh, that wasn't on the, on the original version of the book. And we did this for the translation. And we actually is an improvement of the original material because now more people can access to that, to that too. That's fascinating. And mentioning the, the um, example that you did now from Canada, um, the capital, one of the capital cities. And for me also, when I was a learner of that material, I didn't get it. What's wrong with it? Uh, because the assumption is, you know, your assumption, that's the capital, right? I can't remember what the example was. Was Montreal? Or... I can't remember. I can't remember, right? Um, and uh, my question, the question that's coming up here is, how closely do translators then work with the original um, source creators to be able to to translate meaning but not change you know what the the source intended or what what like not to change the source completely um do, did you work closely with um the english version creator in the case of r4ds uh, um, i was a translator and a reviewer um, the, the person who lead the translation was Riva and she was more in touch with the author. And in the case, so no, 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 in the case of the people who translate and review. Um, and for teaching that together, yes, we, we work really close to the author. We have a Slack a space where we discuss all the things. The, the, the Slack space is pretty funny because we, of course, talk a lot in Spanish. And when we need the help of the author, we switch to Spanglish sometimes, uh, that, that mix of Spanish and English. And we sometimes we just ask him what, why he chose this or what he wants to, and then we adapt. Um, yeah, we did a lot of changes to, to the book. Uh, we are going to try to, take those changes and now put in the English version too. Uh, I think we improve uh, that, that material. The author agree on that. So we are going to, to try to, to, to do the other way around. Uh, Nati just uh, also give, uh, Nati was the, the editor with me of this Teaching Tech Together book. And she remembered that the, the coffee was the, the drink that mentioned on the book and we changed for mate and terere, which are two drinks uh, really <laughs> from this part of the of the world so but yes the, if the author is involved it's a lot more easy and also the license uh, you have the material so we can actually uh, can do the translation because the license was cc by and the author has the rights to, to translate and he wants to do it so uh, that is also an important point that allows 
you to do this work? How you give the license and if you have the right to do this kind of derivative works? Right. It makes me think of um, the project that Camilla was talking about and Metadocencia with um, is translating to Spanish now, also Portuguese, if I understand correctly. Are you also working in teams, Camilla, where um, there, where the original authors are part of your teams? Do you have people in the teams that speak both Spanish and Portuguese? How do you cross this, the meaning bridge um, when you are doing localization to your translations? I think the question is for Janina, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I'm not with Metal Science. <laughs> oh, gosh. So, Camila, you can probably share some example from the Turing way uh, because you're working with uh, Alejandro Coca and Andrea, who we unfortunately couldn't have in the panel because the panel was already large. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, the translation of the Turing way has been like, quite a long process with very different kinds of people contributing for different times of periods. So for example, we have Alejandro, Andrea and Batul who are really helping us now in, the, in this, in this uh, new period. Uh, but at the beginning, we have other people who are like Spanish and also Venezuelans and, 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 uh, and yeah, mostly Venezuelans and Spanish. And I think as we were so unexperienced, I feel like you have been amazing to speak to Janina first before we started because we really didn't know anything. So we sat down and said, okay, let's translate and let's try to make a couple of rules and yeah, let's decide informally, like, yeah, we're going to use informal thing, formal. Uh, uh, but it took us a while to realize, oh, we need to make some rules and we need to, and, and for the future person to come instead of that, like the information and that's something that the Turing way preaches right like a uh, 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 documentation and stuff but we like we we started in such an unexperienced an way that we have learned quite a lot but then on the other hand like with the Turing way as well it's a bit difficult to have the author in the other side because who is the author everyone is the author uh, well Malvika is our main contact but how how, how do you know who who is, is I think a lot more different than having like one author that you want to like uh, directly uh, connect and say what they meant or what they didn't mean. And also something that that happens with the Turing Way translation is that we started two years ago and now the Turing Way is something massively bigger and with a lot more content. And we couldn't keep up, and so and so, and we didn't think about that also when we started. So so, how do you how do you translate effectively a, a, an open source project that is progressing very, very quickly and that is adding new materials and adding new things. So I think in this second round of translation, uh, we have learned a lot of things and we might do better with, with the help of Alejandro and Batul and uh, yeah. Thanks Camilla, sorry for that mix up. Um, I was so, yeah convinced. Anyways, um, we'd like to move on to the next question. Um, and this is a question specifically for Batul. Um, thinking about how can digital infrastructures specifically and ex explicitly support in an equitable way knowledge sharing across multilingual communities, ex um, specifically thinking about different alphabets, um, reading in different directions, um, if you want to share a little bit of your experience and what has worked for you and how technology platforms have also come to the table to support the projects that you're involved in. Thank you, Anil. Um, yeah, I don't have that much experience in digital infrastructure, but uh, I'm going to speak specifically about using non-Latin secrets. So individuals who do not use Latin secrets uh, for writing are often, I think, at disadvantage when trying to do any kind of translation or even using any kind of tools in the web. Um, so that includes apps, tools, softwares, IDEs. So IDEs is basically the software or the GUI that you use to code. Uh, most of them do not support the Latin script. Uh, I'm not going to speak about other languages. I'm going to speak mainly about Arabic, my own experience. So for example, when I do coding, I use Sublime or Autumns to code. But the first one, if I do going to use anything Arabic, uh, the first one shows all the characters, Arabic characters as rectangle. 
So it doesn't make sense at all. I can't write in Arabic, it's sublime. And the second one, autumns, when I do write in Arabic, I can't edit, uh, so the cursor, you can't edit individual letters or words. The cursor does not go into them. Um, and so many people that I know who code in Arabic, what they're going to have to do is basically they copy the Arabic shank to a notes or Word document and then move it back to the editor. They, they, they make the change there and then they move it back to the editor, which is totally insufficient and efficient. Um, still, I would be super happy if that does work and if that's only the only problem. Actually, when you try write any kind of Arabic text, and I mentioned that before, and you're going to at some point, you're going to introduce or add up some time expression or terminology borrowed from other language like uh, like English, and the chance big that that other language is left to right. So, and at that time, be very very prepared because everything going to render like in a crazy way. Last sentence going to become the first one, and so on, and that really creates. Uh, like extra layer of complexity. Um, I was just writing this survey last week and it's a very, very short survey. I was trying to translate it. I spent, I think, three days just to trying to add a single English word between a bracket. Um, so I think some of these like RTL's problem been addressed by the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, but there's still like a really long way to go. Um, some translation platforms, which takes a lot of the pain in terms of automation and cooperation of machine translation, uh, as I mentioned, glossary, memory translation, still also lacks the support for RTL. Some of it is working in to incorporate the feedback of the community. Uh, I believe GitHub released the support for RTL just last month. Um, in January. Uh, and I do now like the support for diverse language for many of the digital tools is not really doable at the same time, but really making the community who use non-Latin script to feel welcome can do also a lot. Uh, I remember my experience contributing to open source library for the Carventry called the Glossario. So Glossario is basically, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is an open source glossary of terminology used in data science and their translation. So uh, the way to contribute is either by adding a new terminology or by adding a new translation in whatever language to the library. Uh, it's written in YAML, so all you have to do is just add one line with the translation. However, when I was doing, I've, I've added just a few, I think, Arabic translation, and the way I see it was not as smooth, as smooth as the other languages, because I would have to add the tags, whereas other Latin script wouldn't have to do this, uh, just because I have these PD tags to control the direction of the word. Uh, and I think back then, uh, Gian Kamavar, uh, at the same day that I made, I made the VR, he went on, done a few modifications in the source code so I wouldn't have to add these tags just to make like my contribution other people who contribute in Arabic or RTL more easier and that really made me like so happy and feel so welcome to contribute so just what I want to say like just appreciating that different language might need different infrastructure and sometime by trying to eliminate some of these disadvantage uh, faced by individual when they try to do these kind of things can potentially help and develop really equitable and more inclusive knowledge sharing systems as well. Um, yeah, back to you. Those are wonderful, wonderful experiences and obviously experiences that many of us in the room haven't had and wouldn't know about, wouldn't understand. Um, but it's really good to hear that they are people who are um, willing and able to help uh, to make these communities and the tools more inclusive. Um, and you know, it, it's fantastic examples. And I think for people in the room who are thinking about how do we fund um, multilingualism in data science, in programming um, and related fields, there's some fantastic examples in what um, Batul and some of the other panelists have given already uh, of places where, where funding could go to, to make things more sustainable. Malvika, would you like to take the next question? Yeah. So um, one of the reasons why I wanted to set this panel is uh, because I really, really, really admire the work that e Knowledge Equity Lab in Canada, uh, led by Leslie Chan, are doing in, in the context of contextualizing openness. So I uh, have studied 
and write quite a lot of work from uh, that lab. And Batul and I had been chatting about it the entire year last year. Um, and one of the aims of Knowledge Equity Lab is to ensure that there are multiple or pluralistic way of knowledge production. So the marginalized voices or the literature that are developed in a non uh, popular language or non popular form of publication are also promoted in the mainstream media. So it's a little bit tangential, but in open science, a lot of our understanding comes from the US or European policies. Um, and a lot of our colleagues actually feel outside this conversation because this, this conversation reaches to them really late, not just because of the language, but politically speaking, because of the knowledge inequity and the power dynamics that still exist in science because of the colonial legacy of the language that we are upholding as the primary language of scientific production and circulation. So I'm really glad that Bobby is here. Bobby is himself a fluent speaker of five languages and a multi Wikimedia uh, chair from South Africa. So Bobby, this question is actually for you uh, because uh, it's very recently that I learned that there's something called low resource language. So drawing from your experience working with low resource languages and different form of knowledge production, can you share what danger of exclusion or imbalanced representation from different communities exist? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the question is actually very interesting because as we grow as nations, uh, you know, we, we, we are dynamic. And uh, as we become dynamic, uh, the language change as well. And uh, they become an exclusive, uh, we, 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 they become an, a, sort of like an exclusive class, you know, of people that are speaking or are keeping that language while the other ones are moving on forward. And uh, that is actually the, lang the, the, the challenge that we are facing. Uh, simply put, is that the older generations that we have that are speaking our indigenous languages do not um, really, uh, they find it hard to understand and to catch up with the young people when it comes to uh, the languages. So one of the things that we basically do, uh, especially as a Wikipedian, who is active here in South Africa, is to try to strike the balance of what is it that we can do in order to uh, bring on, on board uh, the old people and capture that knowledge that they have onto the digital platforms that we have, such as Wikipedia. And then <clears throat> since most of these <clears throat> old people are not computer literate, um, what is it also that we can do in order to capture the young people to capture uh, to, 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 to to capture that language from the old people to store it onto Wikipedia? And most of the time, we find that we found that it is a, it is a challenge because, uh, as I explained earlier, you find that some of the words are not in existence, you know, in the in the uh, language that we speak in day to day, you know, uh, today. Um, and uh, most of the time, then we resort into transliteration, what we call transliteration. I know you know what transliteration is, but basically taking the words um, of English, for an example, if we are, we are translating from the English language to our own um, uh, indigenous languages, to, to, to basically take the, those words that are not in existence and translate, transliterate them to, to, to our indigenous languages. And vice versa. If there is a word uh, of a concept that we want to uh, codify from our um, culture, uh, what we do is to tr try and transliterate uh, the, that word that is indigenous, uh, that does not in exist in the in the colonial language or in the English language, uh, to 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 it. You know, basically, so that we balance and we we, we find a balance between the two. So uh, the challenge basically is, you know, striking the balance as things change. Uh, you find out that some, some of the words, they die, uh, they don't, you know, exist because they die with the, the older generations. And the, the younger ones, they don't know the older generations, but they, because they speak English a lot, 
they cannot even write some of the the, the language you know the the their mother tongue they can actually speak it but they cannot really um um, um, um write it so basically it is really um, to balance between the two um, and and in my in my part i use wikipedia basically to do that and i work with a lot of uh, young people from um, uh, different uh, organizations and uh, and uh, you know doing a lot of um, uh, projects where we bring on board young people who are interested in language who wants to write about uh, whatever it is uh, that is uh, of african content uh, yeah basically that's how we, we we we're doing it here in south africa and thanks yeah. over to you no, I, I was just thinking so my schooling of scientific studies were also in hindi and I was, I grew up in a society that made me believe that the only way to succeed in career is to learn English and do science in English. And I've spent my most of my life unlearning scientific words from Hindi and learning and fitting in into English. That now I cannot go back and explain what I do to my family members, and it's really embarrassing. It's only like you know last few years that I started to reflect on it and take pride in my language and take pride in in the knowledge that they build rather than what you know what we sitting in the global north can offer to them so this non subversive integration of knowledge in the scientific society not in terms of who holds the better understanding of science um, i think one of the example which i really found interesting was from uh, Indonesia, where one of uh, the researchers was talking about working with farmers in remote islands and scientific publications just wouldn't work with them. And you cannot say that the farmers do not know about their land. We can know all we want, but we would never know about their land or how do they work. So I think, you know, maintaining this humility of what we know, what we don't know, and why this collaborative work is so important from across the globe. So I really appreciate what you, what you talked about, Bobby. Uh, also thinking about uh, who is able to participate. Is this knowledge or digital technology just designed for current generation? Or do we want to also uh, you know, bring together our elders and bring to together the younger generation? So, so much to digest there. Um, just want to quickly check if uh, someone else from the panel would like to comment on this. There's a lot, please do uh, take chance to add something on Etherpad or chat, but I'm gonna actually move on to our last question to our uh, last pa panelist, Camilla. Uh, Camilla, you're a uh, research software engineer or research data scientist, uh, both are interchangeably used at the Alan Turing Institute, and you work a lot with technology and you also share a lot of experience from that. So can you please, talk a little bit about what technical as well as social responsibility we must consider when working in the space of uh, diversity in uh, language. Yeah, okay, so I think, how do I start? We, I don't think we can do this without machine translation, right? Like, uh, in, in when when you buy books and then books in your own language are translated by people who get paid for translating because and they only get translated if they know they're going to be sold somewhere else so there is money in the middle and and, and that's quite kind of like what pay the person to do a good job in translating a book but that doesn't necessarily going to happen in all fields of knowledge so 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 we need and, and machine translation is helping us a lot into into make the job of translating a lot of things easier also, I kind of want to add that probably a lot of people here in this panel and people interested in this are volunteers, right? Like they're giving their own time into helping this translation because they believe it's important. But at the same time, volunteers have limited time. And, 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 and then it means that, for example, a book, like I, I'm not happy with how long it has taken to translate it during way, but it's because we are all doing it after work, right? And so and so how how do you do, how do you how do you handle the, the, the part of saying, well, this, is, this resource is not ready until a human has seen it. On the other side of let just the machine do it, right? And when we let the machine do it, there is a lot of connotations in that side. There is a, the, the thing that these are 
large, these large language models that are used to do machine translation and, and general like NLP kind of tasks are built lately by Google, Facebook, these big firms uh, that uh, we might agree or not on the, the way they do things. They are built on, on scraping the web where most of it is in English. Uh, we know the small languages don't do very well in this kind of task. So, so that there is a lot of issues also in just letting the machine do it. But on the other hand, we cannot, how can we stop uh, and the knowledge flowing and, and how can we not, 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 not put it into the public because a human needs to see it, right? And I don't, I don't think I have an answer for that. In fact, my answer is, and, 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 and I see it from, from the point of view of my father. So my father doesn't speak English, my mother, but not, not really no one in my family except from me. Uh, and my father have always wanted to like read all these like uh, international newspapers, like I don't know, the New York Times, The Economist and things like that. And he just recently has started to be able to read them. And he, the, the, the fact that he has access to knowledge just because the, this, this system exists. And I see that, that how important it is for him and, and for a lot of people, I'm grateful for them, even if I know that there are a lot of issues behind. So what I do as a data scientist to tell him and, and, and people is like, you have to know there is a machine that is, you, know, you have to know there is all these issues. So when you read something, be, 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 be aware of that, that, that there is this, uh, this, this middle ground that, we, that is obscure and that is, uh, uh, yeah, basically a black box. But at the same time, unless we start like, well, change the way data science is done and how these new technologies are developed, we, we, we have to embrace because they, they are there, right? And make our life easier. So I think that that's my, my contribution. Very important one indeed. Um, I wonder, David, uh, you're also a research engineer and you do share a lot of uh, points that Camila just shared. Do you have anything else to add to that? Uh, no, not really. Completely agree with all that she said on how important it is to, if you do it by a machine, to get someone to check it. Um, but that's sometimes it's not viable because there's so much things that it, it's been produced all the time. And I don't know, maybe, maybe between all of us, we can do some changes. And I think that what Jenny Sample was giving on changing some certain translations into something more, uh, something that is different, it will help those machines to pick them up those translations later and say, oh, that's also a translation. So that could work in this way. So I suppose that's how those machines learn, learn, but I don't have a clue. But, um, you know, by having more examples where those, social and, and, and global factors are in place, it will probably help to, trans, to, to get more fair translations. I mean, just because I'm calling research engineers, I need to ask Yanni if you have anything to add as well. Uh, well, I, I agree with uh, Camille about the, the volunteer time. Um, because it's also the privileged one who are the one who can participate, the one who, the one of us has free time to, to do this kind of stuff. So um, I also understand that technology uh, helps. I, I actually use a lot of Google Translate and DeepVL and all these uh, <laughs> things that helps. I use Grammarly when I write in English because my English sucks, so I need help of the technology to, to be better. Um, but I going to, to say that uh, we need the, the people because how you do a machine to choose the Maria Elena Walsh song? How you do a machine to know about Mate and Terere? How do you change uh, the example of Brazil for, from the one of Canada? And know that is meaningful for me or the people we are going to to that we have as a target of our uh, material so that is what i think that we need the people behind this and i think this is related to the goal of our material i uh, it's not the same that the dad of camilla can read the paper which is amazing uh, and uh, if we are going to use this material to teach 
and how that reach to the people we are teaching, for example. Um, the, the translation of the book, the, the Teaching Tech Together, take 26 people working for a year in their volunteer time, for example, as how much time this, this effort means. And of course, I will be more fast and better if we have resources. We have money, people who pay to the translator to do their job. So that is a way that we can solve this. <laughs> we can have more, <laughs> more people, uh, human beings doing this, this work. Yeah, David wants to say something. Go for it, David. You just remind me of a, a something happened, an anecdote that happened when I was living in Finland, which someone sent an email, which a whole piece of text in Finnish, and I didn't know Finnish, so I put it in Google Translate, and and then the translation was saying, yes, uh, tonight on um, on the so the text was something about that they were having some kind of a featuring on TV that night in Finland, but the translation was telling me that the that, that program was going to happen in Spain because they ch translate the, the channel name into a and it was sickles like like BBC in UK or uh, so the, the it was not the name of the channel it was like the how you call it the the brand name the brand name the variation of of that channel to the one and it worked like translation was not literally translated was that they pick it up and say oh that's a finnish tv so this is going to be in the spanish tv so i have some hope that they will understand where they translate the capital from a, a canadian example to a brazilian example yeah you, such, you know such an, sorry Yanning. yeah i'm sorry yeah that in the in the spider-man movies they translate the name of the puggle the 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 newspaper that this but with spider-man to Clarín, which is the name of a median in Argentina. I hate that translation, actually, <laughs> because don't add anything, actually. And so it's so weird because you know that it's not Clarín. So but again, yeah, <laughs> we can discuss this a, a lot. <laughs> that, that is exactly for the fireside chat in person. Uh, but yeah, it just really reminds us of uh, importance of diversity in the room where you're doing the task. So it, it is so important to have people bringing in different perspectives. So even though technology has to be developed to do the translation, that technology has to be developed by diverse group of people who are able to call out the biases we are integrating. And of course, you know, that's another topic for another time. But uh, we're going to move towards closing the session. It has been amazing the one hour 20 minutes have just flown by um, and because we've touched on this point over and over that we need investment in this um, i am going to say let's pretend that all these 36 people online right now excluding us are the funders and the people who would like to invest in multilingual space um, assuming that can you all very selfishly tell us where would you like them to invest on to improve and support linguistic diversity in research, technology, and data science? So I'll start with Yanni. Um, yes, as I say, um, I hope we can have translation from any language to English. We have a lot to share and to teach to those who do not speak our languages. And I hope we can also have funding initiative in more than one language, one language from the beginning. I mean, I start to write in two or three or four languages. Um, like, for example, we have Latina as a training web conference from the beginning. And I will love an infrastructure that allow people with little knowledge of computer tools to participate. I mean, we have a lot of people that we, they have to know Git, for example, and how to, to be able to contribute. So yes, I will also love to have money to, to develop that. I mean, uh, Bobby, tell us, where would you like them to invest? Well, uh, I would like really to, for them to invest in uh, sponsoring um, technology in terms of uh, computers and in terms of um, um, phones and in terms of um, app app that is user friendly to translate especially since i'm a wikipedian uh, to translate um, uh, you know um, articles from the english wikipedia to our indigenous languages uh, that has been a challenge especially on wikipedia when it comes to creating a user-friendly 
app that you can just go in there and just type without having to deal with the uh, syntax that is very difficult you know on wikipedia so yeah many of our people uh, here in south africa they lack uh, data uh, which is really a challenge uh, so i would like them to really uh, you know invest in data so that they can have access uh, to 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 edit on wikipedia and computers as well as i've said earlier on in order to enable especially young people to be involved in projects where they can uh, edit and uh, translate uh, 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 um, knowledge and uh, the knowledge to be passed for free of charge to the rest of the world. Yeah, thanks over to you. Yeah, uh, a lot of my colleagues talk exactly about user experience and a user interface to improve the use of technology across you know, non-English speaking communities. And I totally agree with you on that. So folks, please invest on that, uh, Batul. Yeah, um, well, in, in my own experience, just I, I, I do admire when I come through um, some paper or preprint in the archive where author did translate just the abstract, just to make it more accessible to the wider community, especially if the author like is from is an English speaker. However, I know this is very, very challenging and it's not easy. I, I've never done it. And it should not be, I think, used to add an extra layer of difficulty on the author. Um, so I, it might be very impossible, but I would love to see like abstract translated by the journal themselves. Uh, and I need, what we, I think what we need is more like an institutional change in the way we also value these efforts, like people translating their abstract. Because what I see so far, effort taken to overcome any kind of language barriers, like what the panel has been doing, uh, are often ignored uh, by any kind of reformist evaluation. They're not incentivized uh, when evaluating any kind of dissemination activities. Yeah, very valuable input there, but all reminds me of uh, Toma Maboa, who is in Cameroon. He's a researcher, teacher, educator, and he teaches in English and he needs to create the same material in French so that his students across those languages can understand. So it's a double labor. So they are researcher, translator, educator, and multiple hats. And I agree, it shouldn't all fall on the same person's shoulder, especially when publications uh, can pay for that. Thanks so much, Batu. David. Am I still this process? Oh, there you go. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pitch towards something like it's more, I don't know, idealistic, which is about embedding multi language cultures from the beginning, from when you are little, uh, trying to help uh, programs that help kids to learn multi languages, even if you are in a place where you don't have a culture, like, that is easy access because you have friends from different cultures but uh, i think that that will be something ideal in terms of right now in many places like for example myself in spain i learn language as a second thing like a second thought that it was there but i don't know anything about other spanish languages in in, in spain the country like valencia catalonia uh, catalan uh, galego or or basque and, and that for me, I don't know, it seems as a bit of a shame that there's not that uh, to provide those languages to the people in the same country. I know it will be more difficult because you have millions of languages, but at least the ones that are around you or uh, in a close thing, it will be good for the education because these people will be the ones that will be able to translate in the future or uh, be able to to look at it, translation made by machine and saying, no, this is wrong or this is right. And we need more of them. Yeah, uh, I, I think going back to the national uh, policies, uh, I hope Langa was here who could have talked about that. There are many countries that have national level policies. And I agree that even smaller countries with single language probably could have some effort towards that. Very idealistic indeed, but uh, I'm sure that's not impossible. Camila. Okay, it's, it's a bit difficult to, to come with a good idea after all these great ideas and I would like to support all of them, but maybe I'll go again to the side of, uh, of, of, of the technology of this large language models we're using and they're dominating our life and they will keep dominating our life and will keep dominating our translations. And I would like to see them out of 
being built and developed in private companies and more being built and developed by 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 us by by, by the, the users and by and, and, and by 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 groups of diverse people who have different interests than, than these companies and also like the the, the the things that get developed so well for english is because a lot of the competition that make these models better are, are are target on english so they will keep getting developed in that way you can even change the incentives a little bit and it will make things better for other languages especially small languages that, that are not doing very well so that that's like a very idealistic view of, of, of how data science i think should be done and uh, yeah, that's, and also it would be good that volunteers are not volunteers anymore, and so I think can 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 move on 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 better times. So yeah, absolutely agree on everything you said, but you just were very good at catching my attention on the volunteer. It shouldn't be free labor. That's just a dream of open science that I have. That you know, organizations do not struggle to pay volunteers because their time is precious and their work is important. Um, so this is really, really close to the end. And I'm going to ask the same question to Anelda. Something I'm so sorry. I've, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry. I've been having terrible trouble with Zoom today because I recent I upgraded yesterday to a new version and it's just it's been horrible. I'm really sorry about um, my my travels here. My pitch would be to really focus on the conversations that was in the room today. Um, to the funders, you can see there are already some fantastic initiatives going on where people have a wealth of experience and information. Don't go out and design new projects from scratch with project managers and consultants and people who have no experience with this on the ground, no lived experience of translation in data science. Um, find these grassroots efforts and fund them because they can help um, inform organizations who are developing technology, organizations who are spending a lot of time on um, translation, whether it is in business, in industry, or in academia. Um, don't forget about the people that already have experience that may not um, have titles that would expect that you would expect uh, when you're going looking for translators for your projects. Um, so there's great projects here that really could do with some funding to make sure that their translational efforts are sustainable and more sustainable and have larger impact. Find them, fund them. Thank you. What a strong way to finish. Thank you so much, Anelda. And thank you, all the panelists. What a fantastic conversation. I really did enjoy listening in and really glad for everybody who's listening to us and uh, chatting and sharing a lot of useful points for us to think about. This video will be posted on YouTube uh, if you want to share along and we'll uh, invite for the next fireside chat, wherever that topic will be. So once again, thank you all. I'm going to stop recording uh, and stick around for a few minutes. <laughs>